Ladies and gentlemen, mesdames, messieurs, welcome to At the End of the Day. I am your host, Jason Marinchuk, and I am joined today by Father John Whiteford, uh, the Archpriest and Pastor at St. Jonah Orthodox Church in Spring, Texas. Welcome, Father. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. My pleasure. Uh, this has been, I've been looking forward to this one uh, for, a, for a while now. Uh, we are here on the, almost the eve of Great Lent, um, one of the longer, more important uh, ritualistic um, uh, celebrations, ob observations in the Orthodox calendar uh, and in Christianity itself. Um, other people call it Easter, we call it Pasha. Uh, there has been uh, sort of certain confusions, I think, um, leading up to uh, which rituals and, and how, to, how to perform them uh, throughout the inter internets. I am, uh, I have, uh, distanced myself quite a bit from a lot of the online orthodoxy, uh, talk for, I think, obvious reasons, but, uh, I still feel compelled <laughs> occasionally to set the record straight. Uh, and so I, have, I invited the good father to help me do that. Uh, one of the things we talk about on the show is the ritual and reality are one, uh, that which we ritualize, uh, substantiates reality and that reality we, we live in, uh, requires decent rituals and i can't think of any larger ritual than great lent to discuss uh certain subjects like uh sacrifice um suffering redemption and uh salvation so father with that out of the way uh please introduce yourself to the fine people on in my audience some will know your work quite well others will need a bit of an introduction and then we can go from there well, I edit the St. Jonah, um, excuse me, the St. Innocent liturgical calendar, uh, which is sort of an English version of what the Holy Trinity Monastery publishes. And, um, <clears throat> you know, as you mentioned, Pastor St. Jonah Orthodox Church, I have a blog. I write a lot of articles and I don't have a video podcast of my own, really, although I occasionally post some videos that I'll make about things like reader services. But, um, but I'm on a lot of podcasts, uh, just different shows that last me on, and and uh, and I'm, you know, happy to do them. So it's good to be on your show. Again, pleasure is all mine. So, Holy Week, Great Lent. Uh, where would we like to start? Um, let's talk about the significance of the ritual itself. Uh, we are called or we were instructed, I should say, maybe say, uh, as Orthodox Christians to, to model Christ, to put it in sort of a Girardian terms, to be like Christ as much as we can. Um, of course, th this period of time is, is to commemorate his, the, the gospels, his, uh, his, his trip into, uh, in Judea, uh, his eventual betrayal, uh, uh, sacrifice and, and, um, uh, and reincarnate, uh, sorry, and, um, and reincarnation, uh, resurrection, <laughs> sorry, resurrection. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> this is really early in the morning, folks. This is yeah. how much I've been looking forward to this conversation. I got up <laughs> at two o'clock in the morning in Western Australia to have this conversation. So <laughs> forgive me, forgive me father and forgive me. Anyone yeah, no who's watching my, 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 uh, my verbiage is slow, but it's, it, it'll get there. If anyone who's watched this show for any amount of time knows it, sometimes it takes a little time, but It'll get, it'll kick in. You know, the um, KGB used to uh, intentionally arrest people around that time of the morning because people would be disoriented. <laughs> 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 so that's a I'm, tough time of the, of the day to be trying to think. I, I crammed in my prayers this morning, <laughs> just, for, like, just for, <laughs> just for clarity's sake. All right. So uh, where would you like to start, Father? Um, why, okay. Why would we want to commemorate uh this story How, why would we want to uh use rituals such as fasting um and uh and and let's say sacrifice and suffering in our own life to come commemorate this the story of christ well i was raised in a protestant denomination that had very little concept of ritual there was a little bit there but not very much but I remember when I was studying to be a Nazarene minister that my professors who were digging into the scriptures and they would talk about things like, you know, in the Old Testament, when the Israelites celebrated things like Passover, they went through 
ceremonies that caused them to sort of reenact and relive the things they were commemorating. So it wasn't like they were just trying to think about something that had happened in the past, but they were participating in it. And, and they said, we as Christians, you know, we should, we should do the same thing. We should have services where we go with Christ through, uh, you know, Palm Sunday. And then we go through his, you know, his arguments with the Pharisees and the Sadducees in the temple. And then we go through the, the Last Supper and his betrayal. And then we go through his uh, trial and his mockings and the scourgings and his crucifixion. And then we go with him to the tomb and we participate in his resurrection. And uh, the thing is, I'd already, by the time I remember them saying this, and started discovering Orthodox. I'm thinking, you know, you're trying to reinvent the wheel, but this already exists. <laughs> this is what the Orthodox Church already does. Because basically what Great Lent is designed to do is to prepare us for Holy Week. And uh, Great Lent has a lot of its own important commemorations, but basically Holy Week is what, what it's all leading up to. And in Holy Week, we start off with Christ raising Lazarus on uh, Lazarus Saturday, and then we have Palm Sunday. And those are sort of the, the, you know, the celebrations that precede the entry into Holy Week where we start getting into the not so pleasant stuff, but on Holy Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, if you're doing something like the full cycle of services, one of the things that the Typicon calls for is for us to read all four Gospels during the hours of those services, and we do the pre-sanctified liturgy. But why is that? Well, the reason is because that was when Christ was teaching in the temple every day. And so when you're in church and you're hearing the Gospels being read, you're participating in that. You're hearing Christ teach again. Now, most parishes don't do all four Gospels, but in monasteries they do. But in our parish, what we've always done, ever since I retired from the state of Texas at least, is um, we'll pick, we, ro we rotate through the Gospels. And uh, so this year we're going to be doing the Gospel of Mark, which is the shortest one, so it'll make it a little bit easier. But we divided it up. so. Uh, on each of those days, we're reading three parts of the of the gospel, and uh, for a total of nine sections. And when you read a gospel from beginning to end in that context, it really has a, a powerful punch to it because you're. We normally read the gospel in snippets. You know, liturgically, we read one reading or another. Even if you're reading it at home, you might read a chapter a day or something like that. But most people don't sit down and read the gospel from beginning to end. But when you when you hear the gospel from the very beginning and you go with Christ all the way through all those, you know, the, 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 his, his ministry up until the point of uh, his uh, trial and crucifixion and his uh, death and, and resurrection, it's pretty powerful stuff. And that's just the first three days of Holy Week proper, or, you know, the, of the of the week of Holy Week. And uh and that's not counting the bridegroom matins, which happen in the evening. Those are beautiful services, too. And each bridegroom matins has a different theme to it. But in those uh, bridegroom matins, we also read big chunks of the gospel. And, for example, on, on uh, the bridegroom matins for Holy Tuesday, there's the very lengthy gospel reading that basically has Christ arguments with the Pharisees and the, and the, and the scribes, where he says, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. You do this, you do that. And it's just one body blow after another, you know, and we read the whole thing and it's, uh, it's powerful. Uh, and then in a lot of Orthodox churches on Holy Wednesday evening, they actually depart from commemorating what happened during Holy Week. And then they do the Holy Unction service because that's a, a Greek practice that's gotten popular. And so they skip the matins for Holy Thursday, which I think is a mistake because that's the matins where we commemorate the betrayal of Christ and the mystical supper and the institution of the Eucharist. So it's not a minor, <laughs> it's not a minor commemoration during Holy Week. Um, in, in most uh, Russian parishes, in, in my experience, they'll do an unction service during Lent, but they'll do it on a weekday of Lent leading up to Holy Week, but they won't displace that service during Holy Week. Um, and then, um, on Holy Thursday morning, we have the Vesperal Liturgy for Holy Thursday, which again commemorates the institution of the Eucharist. And that evening is when we do the 12 Passion Gospels. 
And that's such a powerful service. I, my wife, who I'd, I'd given up, when I converted to Orthodox, I'd given up the idea that she was ever going to convert. <laughs> but she was coming to church with me, and it was that service that did it, because we read 12 gospel readings about Christ's passion as we stand around with a, uh, a crucifix in the middle of the church. And uh, it's, it, again, very powerful to just sit there and listen to the gospels that talk about what Christ went through for our salvation. And uh, on the, 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 the following day, we have the Royal hours of Holy Friday, which is sort of like the reader's digest version of the, of the matins the night before, because it repeats a lot of the things from that service, but it's also a beautiful service. And then on Friday afternoon, usually at about three o'clock or so, that's when we have the taking down of the of the of the body from the cross and the bringing out of the shroud or the placenitsa or the epitaphios as it might variously be called in different uh, orthodox traditions but that's a cloth that has a depiction of the body of christ after it's been taken down from the cross and uh, so it, at, in, in that service it represents the body after it's just been taken off of the cross and has been placed on the ground before it's taken to the tomb. But then uh, that evening we do the lamentation of Holy Matins, I'm on the Holy Saturday, it's Friday night, mind you, but it's the Matins of Holy Saturday. And so there's a whole long series of hymns we sing about the meaning of Christ's death as we stand around this shroud depicting his body. And then at the end of that service, we do a procession around the church and take the, uh, the epitaphios around with us and then put it back on that stand. But at this point that represents the bearing of Christ. And um, then on Saturday, Holy Saturday morning, we again have a Vesperal liturgy, which is the only Vesperal liturgy that's ever done on a Saturday during the year. Uh, but, but this is the one where we begin to commemorate the resurrection. It's not the full Paschal service that we'll be celebrating later on in the evening, but it's uh, uh, it's the beginning of that. So the gospel reading is actually all of Matthew chapter 28. And uh, the, this there's much many references to Christ harrowing of Hades uh, during that service. There's an excellent uh, homily, I think it's by St. Epiphanius of uh, Crete, if I'm not, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, but it's 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 a powerful sermon. We read every parish reads Saint John Chrysostom's homily on Pascha night. This homily is not universally read, but it's such an amazing sermon. I I think it really should be. But it's all about Christ's harrowing of Hades. Um, and uh, we change the, in the Russian tradition at least. I think in Greek tradition they begin the service in white, but in the Russian tradition we switch to from black to white. Um, during the uh, what would normally be the Alleluia verse uh, after the epistle reading. And um, so that's, an, again, a dr very dramatic moment. And it's in contrast to what we're going to be doing this Sunday, because uh, on Sunday this weekend, we have Forgiveness Vespers. And in Russian practice, we begin that service in the bright gold colors that are out right now. But... Uh, during vouchsafe O Lord, we switch, we, we take off those colors and the black is underneath. And that's when we switch to black and then the melody switch to Lenten. But uh, on Holy Saturday, we're doing the reverse of that. We're taking off the black and we're uncovering the white. And, uh, and so it begins to become very festal, but we're still not there yet. This, this service ends later than usual, but it, because there's a lot of Old Testament readings and traditionally this is when baptisms were done, not in the same, uh, places the service was being done, but the, there would be a baptistry elsewhere where the baptisms would be taking place during the Old Testament readings, and then the people who were baptized would process into the church at the end of their baptisms and then partake of the Eucharist for the first time. But uh, but this service usually ends sometime maybe around one o'clock or so in the afternoon, and uh, and so we have a, this long wait until the midnight service but uh for priests we start hearing confessions at around 10 and start doing proscomedia a bit earlier than that like maybe nine o'clock or maybe even a little bit earlier uh, but uh 
but the midnight office begins usually around 1130. And that has the canon for um, Holy Saturday that's done. So it's still very penitential in Lenten, but uh, towards the end of that uh, canon, uh, when we sing the Irmos of the Ninth Ode, which talks about weep not for me, O mother, for I shall arise. That's when the epitaphios is taken off of the bier in the middle of the church and is taken to the altar, which represents the, the resurrection. And, uh, and then after the midnight office, that's when begin, we begin the celebration of the resurrection proper. We begin singing of thy, re thy resurrection of Christ our Savior. We light all the candles. In, in our parish, we keep the holy fire going all year round. We've kept that for years. So the candle that I'm carrying, the Paschal Trakiri, um, is, is lit with the holy fire from the Jerusalem. And uh, so everybody else lights their candles off of that flame. And uh, so we then do a procession around the church three times, which represents the myrrh-bearing women going early in the morning to the tomb. And... Uh, and uh, when we, we outside of the church, we do sort of a quick beginning of matins, uh, uh, singing uh, the, the apostles. First, we sing the Trapari of the resurrection. The clergy do it three times and the choir does it three times. Then we start singing the apostle Stikira. And then we enter into the church. And uh, when we enter to the church, it's all now lit. It's not dark. And the beer that had the... Uh, uh, Epitaphios on it has been replaced with the stand that has the icon of Christ's resurrection on it. So, and, and so we do the matins, which it goes by very quickly. It's very joyous. And then we go into the liturgy in the wee hours of the morning, and then we have a meal. And then uh, people go home, go get a little sleep, and then come back at around, you know, noon or so. We do it at 1 p.m. We do the agape vespers, and so continue the, the, uh, <laughs> the Paschal celebration, but that's, that's basically Holy Week in a nutshell. There's a lot to, to unpack there. Um, I think there's a lot of talk online, uh, religious or not, about tradition. There's, a, there's a definitely a, a, a deep desire, we'll say, from people on the, the right, but I think it's even in starting to, to hit people on the, on the political left um, for a return to some sort of tradition, um, uh, something that is solid, something that is that is consistent. Uh, you know, we, we've been living in crisis and chaos now for quite some time, uh, depending on where you want to plan plant a flag or where it started. But certainly, for the last decade, people have become more and more aware that they're on unsteady ground um, everywhere in the West. Uh, I would you say that that Holy Week? Like what you were just describing is probably the closest to um, more monastic practices within Orthodoxy, and I kind of want to make a distinction here because I think this is where people kind of fall into traps. You know, I was raised outside of the church growing up as a as a child, but uh, growing up around Eastern Europeans in in uh, in Montreal, you know, some people were more um, let's say erudite, <laughs> more passionate in their faith, my aunt being one of them, but most others were, were fairly um, relaxed about things, um, not necessarily in, in their faith, but in terms of, uh, you know, I see a lot of people online saying things like, you know, don't wear t-shirts, um, you know, uh, they tend to go hard to the paint, um, especially I think for, no, for new converts, there seems to be this heavy lean on sort of monastic teaching and monastic practices, which is f fine, fair. I mean, if someone wants to go be a monk, go be a monk. But for the for the average person, I think it can be daunting, especially if you're new to the church. I mean, I remember when I first started observing, uh, what, three, four years ago now, um, uh, you know, I totally didn't understand fasting to the point where I was just, because what I was reading was like, I, I guess I don't eat until after three. <laughs> like, and I was doing that for a while on Wednesdays and Fridays and it damn well near killed me. <laughs> like, so, so, you know, and then I read more. I'm like, Oh, okay. Well, we don't have to go that hard. Uh, right. So this, maybe you can talk, talk on a bit of that. Like um, the necessity for tradition, which is fair enough, but this overemphasis on, let's say, the hardest parts of the royal path, rather than 
maybe easing yourself into certain things, being practicing forgiveness, understanding that uh, that while you maybe can graduate to much more stringent kinds of uh, of ritual, that on the ground floor um, you need to be, uh, let's say, a bit more compassionate with yourself and others. Well, one of the Desert Fathers said that everything that is of excess is from the demons. And so you can take even a good thing and it become demonic. And, um, you know, with, when you're a new convert, I was this way to some extent when I was a new convert and I started getting into the services, I figured, hey, let's do it all the way. Let's not do these abbreviations and stuff. Um, but um, then I started reading things like, you know, Father Sarah from Slobodskoy's Law of God, where he's talking about how things are normally done. And he talked about normal parish abbreviations. And there's also an article by St. John of Shanghai. And the title of it is something like How to Keep the Tipicon. But basically, he talks about normal parish ab abbreviations. And it, it occurred to me one day that these abbreviations would have been the same kinds of things that St. John of Shanghai and other saints would have seen in the parishes that they grew up in. And so if it was good enough for them, it's probably okay for us too, you know? Uh, and so, and also as I, when I became a priest, priests obviously want people to come to the services and you have to strike a balance between going, you don't want to go to the extreme where you basically water everything down and it's just all easy and there's nothing to it because then people aren't going to come just because they get the idea that there's just watered down uh and 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 not very uh substantive and uh, you certainly don't want to start making stuff up like some people are tempted to do but when you go to the other extreme and it's no abbreviations whatsoever it can be very difficult for the average layman to adapt to that and so some churches that try to do that wind up having like two or three people at the vigil because they're doing everything to the hilt and most people can't handle it so they just don't come so I, I think it's good to do what's normal Russian practice and, uh, you know, stick to that. Now, if you're in a monastery, it's a very different thing. And there are laity that will go to services in monasteries, and they kind of know what they're getting into when they decide to do that. So if you go to a monastery, it's not going to typically be uh, parish abbreviations, and it really shouldn't be. Uh, but in a parish, I think that that's those those things are reasonable. A, a typical vigil should not be more than about two and a half hours. Occasionally, there might be, like during Holy Week, obviously, there are some services that might blow past that a bit just because there's so much to do. But if you if you do that as a rule, it it just makes it hard for people, particularly people with kids, to to do it. And uh, you know, in our in our parish, we normally in the past had maybe 10 to 15 people this is several years back that would come to the vigil and then we'd have you know before we doubled in size we would maybe have like 80 to 90 people on sunday morning but uh when eventually we started getting a substantial number of people who came to the vigil and now we're sometimes looking at 50 to 60 people for vigil and um and I think what's helped with that is, is that when you had, when I had people who had be, become new converts back when we had lower attendance at vigil, I think they would come to vigil and not see very many people there and figure, well, hey, this must not be very important. And they wouldn't come. But now people who come to vigil see, hey, there's a lot of people here. So they keep coming. And, and I think that's a good thing. But our vigils range some a, a really a, you know the on the on the short end of a service we might occasionally have a vigil that ends if you're counting the first hour like right around maybe two two hours and ten minutes sometimes a very long can or something like that it might go a little bit past two and a half hours but it's somewhere within that range and i think that's manageable for most people of course you know if you have kids and you're not able to do the whole thing you can come to parts of it and leave early that's also true uh, and I tell people that just because I think it's good for people to try to make it to at least part of the vigil if they can. Um, some people have to drive so far, you know, in our area, and it's hard to get across Houston, <laughs> particularly if it's a weekday service. 
that uh, they can't always make it. But for the people who live within driving range, it's good to be able to come to vigil as often as you can. Mm. You know what, when the interesting things, when I um, got in contact with the, with the Ukrainian church here, um, well, hours from my, where I'm living now, um, and sort of speaking with my priests here and, um, and preparing for a catechumenism, you know, I was, he asked me what my, my prayer um, rituals and what I was doing. And I kind of detailed things out in my morning prayers and that kind of thing. Um, and he was like, yeah, that's great. He's like, you know, just Jesus prayer. Say, say the Jesus prayer often and fast and you're good. <laughs> like, you know, you're, you're, you kind of get this preparation almost like, okay, I got to do Vespers. I got to do this. I got to do that. I better, you know, get all my, you know, uh, get my prayer book out. Like getting have it, have it in my pocket all the time. And most times it's just say the Jesus prayer and fast and, and you're, and you're on your way. Um, Let's speak, speak of the Jesus prayer for a second. Um, I found, I, I've, how do I say this? It, it, it's a very powerful prayer. If people don't know what, what the prayer is, I'll just say it briefly. Uh, it's uh, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy me, a sinner. And there's slight variations, but that's what I use. Um, I become aware that saying or using the Jesus prayer out loud to people, um, you have to be kind of careful or cautious or aware that it tends to um, to affect people. Uh, I know the effect of, on myself, but after you've been saying it for a long time, you know, you only see the benefits. And I've seen in a few instances in my life relatively recently where I can track back almost the conflict to me saying or advising, hey, you might want to say the Jesus prayer. This might this might help you. Um, and then having sort of conflicts arise with that person. Um, maybe you can speak on that a little bit, because I find that a very interesting phenomenon. Um, that's not something that I've noticed, but that doesn't mean that that's not a reality. I just haven't noticed it. But uh, when someone's new to the church, you know, like when I just make them a catechumen, one of the things I'll usually do is talk to them briefly about starting a prayer rule and uh, getting a prayer book. But I try to encourage them to do sort of a modified prayer rule that's short because it's it's a lot harder to start with, you know, say the, you know, the full Jordanville morning prayers and evening prayers are about 20 minutes apiece, roughly. And for a lot of people taking 20 minutes in the morning to pray, they might be able to do that briefly, but maintaining it is the problem. And so what I do is I'm, I have copies of the rule of St. Pacomius that I keep in the stand where I hear confessions. And so when I'm talking to people about prayer and confession, I often will give them a copy of this. And the rule of St. Pacomius is a fairly simple rule, but it's the oldest prayer rule in the church. And you'll notice once you look at the structure that most of our services are roughly based on the outline of that prayer. Um, and as it was revealed to St. Pacomius by an angel, but it basically consists of the Trisagian prayers, the 50th Psalm, the Creed, and then saying the Jesus prayer a hundred times, and then the dismissal prayers. Um, and so, one way to use this, the rule of St. Pacomius is just to memorize that, have a prayer rope handy, do the Jesus prayer a hundred times, just like it says, and then do the dismissal prayers. Particularly if you're on the road and uh, let's say, you know, by the time you get home, you're going to be dead tired. and It's going to be very hard to stand in your icon corner and pray. It's not a bad idea to just do that from memory on your way home. So that at least you've done that. Um, but uh but another way you can use the rule of St. Pacomius, as I'll point out to people, is you can think of the rule of St. Pacomius as sort of like two slices of bread making a sandwich. And the Jesus prayer is what goes in the middle. Mm -hmm. But uh, but you can put other things in the sandwich. You know, so you've got the, you know, the, the opening prayers, the 50th Psalm, the Creed, that's the top slice. And then the bottom slice is the dismissal. But you could take the prayers that are in the Jordanville prayer book in the you know for the morning prayers and do, make sure you at least do one prayer to the lord one to the mother of god one to your guardian angel and when there's more than one of those you could uh rotate through them and um and then do the dismissal prayers and that will take you probably five minutes or less to do 
And so to get people started, I try to get, encourage them to do something like that. And once you get into the habit of praying, you can always add to it. And there's, a, there's other things you can do too, certainly. Uh, like another thing that's good is there's a, there's a book that's called The Spiritual Psalter of St. Ephraim the Syrian that was compiled by St. Theophon the Recluse. And it's sort of modeled on the Psalter. So there's 150 prayers, but these are all prayers from the writings of St. Ephraim the Syrian. Well, you could take one of those prayers and, and make that what you put in the sandwich every every day and uh, and, and use that. So th- th- this provides some variety, too, whereas if you're just doing the prayers in the prayer book exactly the way they are, they're long. And also you can get to the point where you've gotten them so in, in your head to where you're kind of going on autopilot while you're doing it, which is not a good thing. So, so changing things up a little bit sometimes can be helpful. Well, I think intentionality is really what's key. You know, I, I do it with my morning prayers, the one that includes the, the, the Lord's Prayer that I think most right. people are familiar with. And I'll stop, I'll, sometimes I'll catch myself if I'm just getting up. I, one of the things I'm now training myself is, is saying the prayer um, first thing upon waking. Um, and that can sometimes be challenging. It's like, it's almost like forget, you know, putting milk in my coffee on, on Wednesdays. It's like, damn, damn it. <laughs> you know uh why um but getting into that rhythm is i think and and making it a ritual and making it a habit is very important but what's also important uh is having the intentionality and the purpose behind it if this is just something like i just do this every morning which is good but also it it you would lose the the reasoning behind it that's this isn't just you do it because you 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 join this group, you know. Uh, you, you're doing it for a for a higher purpose. Right. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about the structure of prayers because I think that's something that people I think if you've been from a Protestant or even from a more Roman Catholic bent, where people kind of just make up prayers, um, you know, uh, this idea of a personal relationship. So you're just talking to God. Um, maybe we can talk about that a little bit, and also, Father, if you don't mind. Uh, as a bit of a side quest, there's a sort of a distinction I think people make or a confusion about the importance of the saints uh, and praying to uh, and correct me if I'm wrong or my phrasing here. It's, see, it's coming, it's it's working, folks. Like the brain's the brain's working now. <laughs> We're through the second cup of coffee. It's, it's starting to kick in. Um, the uh, the importance of praying, I think a lot of people think when we're praying with the saints, that they're praying to the saints. And there is a distinction to be made there. And one that once I kind of figured that out and started praying with the saints or to the saints who pray with me, maybe that's a better way of putting right. it, uh, including the divine Theo- Theotokos, like that is, that's your like, you're leveling up. You know, like you, you kind of get to these different stages of grace um where things become more and more revealed to you and you and you and you start to understand the more fullness of this experience so anyways right. um let's start with that uh, the the structure of prayer why you shouldn't go um you know improving let's say uh and then uh the importance of prayers with the saints well, when you pray the prayers of the church on a regular basis you actually can improvise prayers when you need to and have them sound like prayers of the church because you've learned how to pray. Uh, but, uh, you know, because, for example, let's say you've got a child that's sick and uh, you don't have a prayer for a sick child handy. If you just using your own words, say, you know, God, help me deal with this and help, heal, you know, heal my child, you know, you're, you're whatever the the needs you're feeling, if you just pour this out before God, that can become, you know, a very powerful prayer. Uh, but um, written prayers instruct us how to pray. And the biggest book of the Bible is the Psalms, and the Psalms are all written prayers. So obviously they can't be wrong. So people who say that it has to be improvised to be real prayer obviously don't understand it. And Protestants have such a um, low uh, level of understanding about what worship is that they've come to think of prayer as worship, which is why 
it feels strange to us to talk about praying to the saints because we we are in a you know we've grown up in a protestant culture where that doesn't sound right but if you think about what the word pray actually means it really means to ask and um i i work for the attorney general of the state of texas for about 15 years or so before i retired from the state worked for another agency prior to that and so i wrote petitions to the court all the time and the petitions to the court always ended with a section that was called the prayer <laughs> So we pray the court that we will be granted all the relief that we are asking for in this petition, et cetera. But it's called the prayer because we're asking the court to do something for us. And it doesn't mean we're worshiping the court. It just means we're making a request. So when we pray to the saints, we're asking for them to pray for us and um, you know, to, to provide their heavenly assistance. And there's nothing wrong with that because we believe that God's not the God of the dead, but of the living and the saints are you know, still part of the church, even more so than those of us that are still around in the flesh. And uh, so as scripture tells us to ask for each other's prayers and to pray for each other, we do that with the saints too. And uh, I knew a guy who his kids were going to a Pentecostal school. His wife actually taught there. And uh, for some reason, they were trying to explain to some of these Pentecostals the concept of a patron saint. (laughs) And the way they the way they explained it to him was was well this is our special heavenly prayer partner, <laughs> and that's not a bad way of putting it to at least for Pentecostals to understand what you're what you're it talking works. about. They, I think that if you start introducing like you know name days and name saints and birth saints and it would kind of blow their mind. Like my my birth saint is Saint Elijah, and I you know I I do I do. Uh, my critics sometimes tell me I'm a, I'm a bit of a zealot. I think they use different <laughs> phrasings for that, but right. um, we'll we'll go with zealot. I think that's the the kinder the kinder right. phrasing. So, repentance, salvation. Here's another one. Here's another big one, um, which seems to be confused. Even I, I'll, I'll start it off with let's say let's go back even to suffering. One of the Things, one of the more aha moments I had, and in fact, it's probably what um, led me back to the church, uh, amongst other things. But uh, there was a, I connected the something that I, I had been in conflict with, was that God's love includes suffering and doesn't exclude it. That suffering is part of, not just of life, but a part of his love for us. Um once I made that connection, and it was probably just because I was about to be about to be a father, and as you become a father and, and you're raising your child with that sort of awareness, you start to understand a lot more on a on a more personal, basic level. But then you start right. to extrapolate that out to a to a heavenly father, and you're like, oh yes, this totally makes sense. Um, yeah, maybe we can start there. The importance of suffering, because it's, I see with and correct me again if I'm wrong here, Father, but when we ritualize sacrifice, such as food uh, and fasting, part of, I think, my, at least in my understanding of it, is we are ritualizing sacrifice in, let's say, manageable ways. One of the interesting things about the fast, whether it's your weekly fast or one of the, one of the larger fasts like Great Lent, is that it's almost not a sin. I think you said this on Buck Johnson's Counterflow uh, podcast, which everyone should look, should go and uh, watch. I have the links in the description below. Um, it's not a sin, quote unquote, to, to break the fast. Uh, and, but it's a weird thing that I know on a personal level that whenever I do, whether it's intentional or unintentional, you do feel that shame. It feels like a sin. Uh, you know, it, it, I certainly repent for it afterwards. And it becomes sort of a, that minor suffering, that little, you're practicing suffering, um, either to in sort of a similar relationship with, with Christ, but also for yourself. Like, this is a suffering that I can control, that is within my means to, to either experience or not experience. And to purposely do that, especially for a long period of time, like with Great Lent, there's, it's not just to, 
uh, model Christ and, and, and his story, but also to experience that, like you said, to be sort of active in both the faith and the ritual. Um, so maybe we can talk about that a little bit. Um, suffering and the importance of suffering to understand God's love and, and our relationship to, to him. Well, when it comes to breaking the fast, what the point that I made on Buck Johnson's show was is that eating a hamburger, for example, is not inherently sinful. Right. But eating a hamburger during Great Lent when you don't have a good reason to do it is sinful, not because it's inherently sinful, but because you're blowing off the disciplines of the church that everybody's supposed to be doing together. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there are always exceptions to these things. and um, there's a interesting story that Saint about Saint John of Shanghai because Father George Lauren, when he was a boy, uh, he, he's a very senior archpriest in uh, I think it's Nyack, New York, but uh, but he was he was born in Shanghai and uh, he admired Saint John very much and he was trying to keep the fast very strictly. And his mother and father took him to St. John. It was during Lent and said, this boy won't eat what we're telling him to eat. And St. John made him eat a, a sausage <laughs> right in front of him. And he said, uh, you know, ob obedience is more important than fasting. <laughs> and, you know, he was a boy. He was under his parents' authority. And his parents were telling him not to keep the fast strictly. And he was being willful. So he was made... <laughs> to eat a sausage during during Lent, which obviously wasn't a sin at that point for him because he was doing what he was told to do. Um, but, um, but you know, on some level, you could say fasting is, it, there's a certain amount of suffering that goes with that because we're denying ourselves, We're not having what we would otherwise normally want to eat. We're eating less of what we would normally like to eat if it was just up to us. And uh, so this is a sort of a voluntary suffering that we go through. But any kind of suffering can be for our salvation. And uh, St. John Christum has a homily, and I can't remember the precise title, but it's something like how on, on why no one can harm you but yourself. And it's all about how there's, there's really nothing that anyone can possibly do to you that can really ultimately harm you. It's only you that can harm yourself by responding to those things in a bad way. So somebody could be torturing you to death and it could be for your salvation if you respond to it in the right way. But on the other hand, when people abuse you in some way and you respond to it by becoming bitter, it can be for your damnation too. So it's all a question of how we choose to respond to what God has put before us. And as Christians, we have to believe that the suffering that we go through is something that God has in his providence allowed for us to endure because there's some benefit for us to get from it. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that it's going to be easy to go through, obviously not. But if we go, if we approach it with that attitude, it can become a good thing. And, and also during the Lent, it's a penitential time, obviously, but the, the, the saints and the fathers refer to it as joyful mourning. And we're mourning, but it's a joy to it. Mm -hmm. And even the Jesus prayer, if you think about the words of the Jesus prayer, it's penitential, but there's a joy in it. You know, when we say, oh, Lord, Jesus Christ, son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's penitential, but there's a joy in it because we know that God will be merciful to us when we repent. He's, he's promised us that he'll do so. So even though we're repenting and we're asking God to have mercy on us because we're sinners, which, you know, is not the happiest thing to think about that you could possibly think of. But when you think about what God's going to going to do for you and what he has done for you, there's joy behind that. You're, you're, you're happy to do that because you're, you're talking to someone who loves you and wants to save you and will forgive you of your sins. And uh, so that's, that's what we're doing in Lent as we're engaging in this, um, you know, this sort of dance, you might say between suffering and pain and mourning but also joy as we draw nearer to christ saint sarah from rose i should maybe say blessed saint sarah from rose uh, blessed father sarah from rose i should sorry i should say um one said i'll paraphrase here is that it's best to always assume that you me or you are it are the worst sinner possible that you are right. the worst 
and to make excuses or to find forgiveness for everyone else. Right. Uh, and that to start your, your day and your process at that level uh, every day. And I, I return back to that quite often because after the events of 2020 uh, in the last few years, I think we're, we're short on forgiveness quite often. And there was even a lot of conversations like, how can we forgive these things? How can we forgive these people? Never forget, never so on and so forth. Even with the situations going on, Ukraine and Russia, Israel and Gaza. Um, once we started introducing politics into the into religion or having to have both, I, I say, it's wearing two hats. I'm be talking to dissident mama about this at the end of the month, about the challenges of being, let's say, a right wing or you know, political podcaster of any kind, um, and also being a practicing Orthodox Christian. Is that you're constantly uh, sometimes being challenged to you know where where is your allegiance on this one um, right. you know which hat do you wear more than others i've you know i've said um i think on this podcast and conversations that when dealing with the with the gaza <clears throat> situation you know if i put my power and politics hat on uh you know it's not that i should say i i'll be careful here it's not that i approve of any actions however the the you know what i would advise from a pure power politics position would be a lot more um, in line with what Israel's doing. You know, it's like, well, that's, if that's what you want, this is how you do that. Um, and, you know, repercussions notwithstanding. Of course, I put my humanitarian and Orthodox Christian hat on and I have a different response. Um, that doesn't seem to sit well with a lot of people. They want you to be one or the other. They always want a certain answer. A lot of the things we're talking about with civilizational capital with Matthew Erickson from the King Pill podcast, everyone's on board until you get to the point where we're saying, yeah, ethno state's probably bad. Like, you know, we're, we're not racialists. We're not, we're not into that kind of thing. This isn't, if you're looking for that, this, is, this isn't your cure. Um, and then you get there, that response. Like, well, you know, I thought you were a distant right winger. I'm like, I, well, I am, <laughs> but, you know, yeah. but I'm also not stupid. So, there's, 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 you know, for me, it's, it's, it's very simple for other people it gets confusing. Um, so that's a long winded way of, of getting around to maybe this question is one of the challenges I see, especially with online orthodoxy is people who don't know how to balance those two worlds. Uh, and who I think sometimes veer too much on the political who, who seem to be unable to give that up um, or try to mush it into an orthodox message. Uh, Father Turbo once said that, you know, a lot, a lot of people come to the church because they're, 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 they like the church, you know, placing taboos on everything else that they enjoy until that they find out that the problem is actually them. Um, you know, when the church turns their eyes on them then all of a sudden they don't like that anymore. Maybe we can speak about that a little bit. Um, where does where does politics belong in the church? Does it belong at all? Uh, is is it something that you should just leave outside the door? Uh, and then, it, of course, in our in our everyday life, do you have any advice or any thoughts on how to balance those two things for people? Because I think that's it's coming to a head quicker than we than we we'd like, and there you know uh, we're we're in interesting times so. Um, one thing I would recommend to people, I had not listened to this until fairly recently, but on Spotify and YouTube, somebody has recorded all of Father Seraphim Rose's lectures in what's called the Orthodox Survival Course. And uh, the person reading this, you, you, you have to be prepared that there's some English words that he mispronounces. And there's he mispronounces a lot of Russian words, too. Uh, but if you can get past that, it's it's uh, uh, it's a very useful podcast because basically, father, father, I think they're recorded, but the quality of the recording is so bad that's the reason why it had to be re-recorded. Somebody wrote a transcript of it, and um, but basically, what he does, he starts off with the great schism and talks about how the West went off the rails, and he starts off with the immediate aftermath of the great schism and how that led to things like um, 
the, you know, some of the stranger views of the followers and Saint, you know, Francis Assisi himself, and then sort of um, chiliastic views of of things like the people predicting that the third age of the uh, of the Holy Spirit was getting ready to begin. And then eventually you get into sort of the, you know, the, the pre-Protestant scholastics and then the, the, the Protestantism. And then you start getting into revolutionary thinkers that start getting you up to step by step to where we have the world that we're in right now. But we've been going through a whole series of revolutions because we have people who think in terms of ideology rather than in a traditional Christian way. And um, so I would recommend listening to those things because I help. I think it helps a lot in terms of putting what we're seeing in the world today into perspective. But when it comes to politics, one thing I would encourage people to do is it's it's good to read writers and recent saints that talk about these things because they give us a lot of perspective on how to uh, deal with these things in a more orthodox way. But you do need to have enough of an imagination to understand how people can come to different conclusions than you without being evil people. <laughs> uh, you know, my wife was born in communist China and I know that's her groundbreaking to... father, John, what are you, what are you talking about here? Come on. <laughs> Crazy my my wife's family lived through the, the cultural revolution and uh, starvation and my mother-in-law's family was largely wiped out by the communists back in the, in the, uh, um, early days of the People's Republic of China, and uh, and of course, after becoming Orthodox and becoming aware of the things that the new martyrs went through, I, I'm not a big fan of communism, for example. <laughs> but uh, and I'm not a big fan of socialism, ge- more generally speaking. But I can see why people would be attracted to that. I could see why on paper it seems appealing to people. And so when I hear someone talking like that, like Jackson Hinkle, you know, I, I don't, you know, pay a huge amount of attention to what he has to say, but I occasionally hear him talk. And I, I'm not sure if he's actually become Orthodox or if he's just interested in Orthodoxy. But, uh, you know, he, he describes himself as an Orthodox Christian, yet he, he promotes what he calls MAGA communism. <laughs> and, uh, and thing is, I'm not f- in favor of that, but on the, at the same time, I don't think the guy is evil for thinking that. You know, he's a, still a y- relatively young man, and hopefully, uh, Winston Churchill's uh, words about how if you're young and you're not a liberal, you have no heart, and if you're old and you you are not a conservative, you have no head. <laughs> Maybe that'll be that'll prove true in his case, but, but I, I I do think that listening to Father Sarah from Rose's lectures will help people to maybe see why any kind of ideology is not a good thing. It, 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 but ideological thinking takes certain ideas which may have some validity to them, but then it imposes them on everything else and you make everything else fit into this ideological framework, whether it really fits or not. And, uh, just- and you also feel the need to impose this on other people. Whereas if you're thinking about things in a traditional way, you don't you don't approach life that way. There might be things that you can't make sense of, but you use the things in the tradition to try to help you make sense of those things. Uh, but but and and you also and also you know there is progress in society. We hope over time, and there's things that we maybe need to change. But it's better to do it in a traditional way, where you're trying to think about a. a sort of organic solution to problems rather than coming up with some ideology that you then go around and killing everybody who doesn't agree with you until you establish this utopia you're trying to establish. Yeah. Ideas so great that they have to be enforced upon people constantly yep. <laughs> uh, with the police state. It's, it's usually an indication of something. I've said something along the lines that uh, ideologies fail because they're not phronomas. They're not, they're not a full worldview. They're, people will try to make them one, um, you'll see this a lot with libertarians and a few other groups where they th- believe they have found some moral good within the ideology, but all these things are, ass- are, are, are assumed. You know, one of the great awakenings I had was, un- was uh, realizing that, uh, that people weren't as good as I thought they were. You know, growing up in Canada, you have sort of a baseline idea of Canadian and Canadians and 
and qual the quality of the people. Um, and, you know, I think that can be largely true. Um, I've said, I've shared this story before on the show. So people who listen, you know, skip ahead if you need to, um, I'm going to say it again. So, uh, George Floyd pro protests that were happening on the summer of Floyd. I was living in Montreal on a second story duplex with a large window looking out to a park. My daughter had either just been born or was about to be born. Uh, I can't remember the exact timing. And I looked out into the park and saw a lot of people having a religious ceremony, kneeling to a dead uh, black man in America. Now, this is happening in Montreal, Canada. And I saw them all kneeling in the park and in a, in a direction. And some of those people were atheists and some of those people were of other denominations uh, who I knew in that crowd. And that was, I think, the triggering event where my, and at, at that point I was very much an atheist and in the Christian school I had been softening, but I describe it as sort of these contradictions sort of stack in your brain and this is what ideologies do to you. Like they're forcing you to, to, to agree with things or believe in things that are unsubstantiated in some ways. They're only substantiated on the subset of, of what the ideology tells you it is. You know, liberalism is good. Socialism is good. And the other thing is, is evil and bad because those evil bad people did evil bad things. And if you point out that the, you know, liberal people and stuff also did evil bad things, that's you're now you're just a bad person saying bad things. So I, I always think of it as sort of like a, you know, those cartoons where the, the, you know, the, the dirty dishes are piled up to the roof, right? And it's just, they're wobbling and they're just waiting for one instance to kind of fall. And I think when you have that moment, you either go crazy or you find a church or maybe a bit of both and maybe in my case. But I remember seeing that, that protest that, and seeing it as a, as a religious ceremony and that started that cascade in me, which led to a religious experience. Um, but it was that moment where I was like, something's wrong. Like, this doesn't compute with all the other priors that I've been holding in my brain. And the fact that these people are doing this uncritically on mass globally throughout the West was also the thing that went pink. Uh, and, and here we are <laughs> now I'm talking to father John Whiteford on a, on an early, uh, uh, Saturday morning. So I don't know if there's a question in there, Father. Maybe just you can maybe make a comment on that. The ideologies versus frontimas. You know the, the fact that these things are incomplete worldviews, and I think that when people become possessed by these ideologies, uh, for lack of a better word, the horror shows of the 20th century are just are laid bare upon us. You know, I've been saying um, I've been using a concept called the vengeful sun, which I've sort of christened as the spirit of the age. Whether you want to call that a zeitgeist or a egregore or in Girardian speak, would say a, a mimetic contagion. But this vengeful son being born from both the tyrannical father of the early 20th century, you know, born out of the distant fathers of, of, of post-World uh, World War I, World War II, and the Depression, leading to a devouring mother archetype of the 1960s, sort of, you know, come on to me, bring all your children suffering onto me, and I will smother them, uh, and, you know, <laughs> do and make, make, make men, men into women and women into men. Um, and now, of course, well, I think we're heading into a period where the the, the generational offspring of that will be uh, an offspring that's aware of a betrayal, a generational betrayal and lies, and is waking up to that fact and is very, very angry. And I'm seeing lots and lots of um, good examples of that. So I know that's a lot to lay at, at your feet, Father, but anywhere you want to pick at that. Um, well, I think great. you're you're having recognized the religious aspect of the BLM social justice warrior uh, phenomenon was insightful. There's a Protestant evangelical by the name of Jonathan Harris that's written a lot on the subject. Um, and uh, basically he's described in great detail, basically the, the false gospel of the, uh, you know, of uh, critical race theory, social justice warrior, the woke church. And um, it's it it mimics certain aspects of the Christian gospel, but really, there's ultimately no forgiveness. <laughs> you know, you 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 go through these rituals where you acknowledge your guilt because you were born white, and you can atone to them to some extent by becoming, you know, a social justice warrior who's an ally of the oppressed. 
but at the end of the day, you ultimately are never really forgiven because you're still a white person. And this is one of the, this is a good example of an ideology where you take certain things that may have some truth in some cases, but then you, it becomes an ideology and now you're viewing everything through this ideological lens and anything that doesn't fit is made to fit. And so if you have a police officer who is conscientiously doing his job and he's dealing with a black criminal and he winds up, uh, you know, that he does everything he's supposed to do. And yet, nevertheless, a guy who's overdosed on fentanyl and has COVID <laughs> dies and he's now uh, con a convicted murderer. And basically the mob, the social justice mob would not have accepted anything less if that jury had not come back with, he's a murderer and you know, given a manslaughter even, that would not have been acceptable. They would have burned down the city. And, um, and so the fact that this guy may not really be guilty or that he you know, doesn't really deserve what he's gotten doesn't matter because the narrative is white man bad, white man commits crimes against people of color and we've got to basically turn the tables and stick it to the man and uh, that's not healthy and you know another good book for people to read by a non-orthodox writer is ideas have consequences by richard weaver it's a conservative classic but he uh, he basically talks about how the west started to go off the rails from his perspective and talks about the sort of almost mental illness that we've gotten into where, for example, you know, back during the Renaissance period to be an educated person meant that you mastered all the various fields of knowledge. But now we have people who specialize in some area of knowledge that is so small that they may be the world's expert on you know, like a, a the cornea of an eye, for example, but they don't know how all that relates to everything else because they're just so focused on this one thing. And there might be some useful knowledge that comes from people who get so focused on these little slivers of knowledge, but it's it's like a mental illness that we, 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 we can't really explain or understand the universe that we're in because we've tossed out any traditional way of putting those things into place. And so as sort of a coping me mechanism, we get so focused on these little things and that becomes everything for that person. But they really don't know how what they know fits into a bigger picture. It's just really unhealthy. And uh, so I think that what we as Orthodox Christians need to do is to try to sort of walk ourselves out of that kind of insanity and try to... It takes time, but basically we'd have to go through what's known as a worldview shift where we start thinking in traditional ways. And that requires unlearning and learning at the same time. Uh, and it's a process. But, uh, but ideological thinking will take you down that road. And that's why any ideology, even if it's a conservative one, is not the traditional way of looking at it. The traditional way of looking at life is to have a holistic approach to it and see it as a Christian would see it. Mm. I mean, a lot of what we do on what I do on the show, even from the friend or fed show and a, and a few others is, is challenging priors. I found that was very important to me when I, um, I'll say this briefly again, people who've seen the show have heard this story before, but, uh, I almost don't want to over say it now, but, um, when my child, my, my daughter was born. We were going into second lockdown in Montreal, Canada. Um, uh, I started to have a series of breakdowns. And if anyone who knows me knows that I, I, I operate on generally two emotional frames, which is annoyed uh, and slightly less annoyed. So I, I'm just very Slavic with these kind of things. I'm <laughs> relatively cut off. Um, so going through those, going through, a, a, let's say, a very obvious emotional uh response was just uh, unlike me i was i was crying at the set, like um rainbow connection would come on i'm bawling and i just had gotten to a point where i didn't know I, nothing was making sense anymore uh and i had this young daughter and my wife and you know uh, all these other things were going on in the world and i and i called out in a moment of desperation like what do i do 
and I had a very clear voice answer me to bear witness. He just told me, told me, bear witness. I said, okay, uh, not knowing what I got myself into. Um, and then a week later was hit by the, by a, an ap- absolute train of, of shame that, that I, I think in some ways confirmed the experience. Cause for about a week after I'm like, what just happened? Right. Maybe I am going crazy. And when I hit, got hit by that shame, that in a way confirmed it, that something's happened. Like this is not of just of my mind that I'm conjuring this. Um, and that sort of has led me to where I'm, I am now. But um, I share that story in terms of understanding that once I had that, and once I under, started to understand what had just happened, it forced me to, to realize something that I didn't want to realize, which is I was wrong about everything. So I had turned from God in anger when I was 11 years old because my, my grandfather died of bowel cancer. I couldn't square that idea of an all-loving God and the suffering of my grandfather. So I turned away in anger, led me for 32 years as an atheist. Having that moment with the George Floyd thing started to spin my wheels, brought me, brought me to that point of desperation, called out, received message, then had to go, oh crap, I'm wrong about everything. Like the whole entire structure of my life, the way I'd, I had thought about the world was now incorrect. That's an incredibly humbling position to be in i don't recommend it for people by the way (laughs) you can avoid it or you can humble yourself in another way i would i would say do that uh because i'm going to tell you it's not it's not nice but it's also considering how i am probably the only way that god could get through to me so there there we go um i say all this because i think what's holding people back quite often is is that point of pride where no one wants to let go or examine their priors. They want to continue on with holding on to what has got them here. You know, whether it be the Republican Party, the Democrat Party, the democracy, uh, liberalism, nominalism. Adam Patrick and I just did a show about nominalism being a civilization killer. Um, yeah. You know, sorry, Father. I That's what Richard Weaver want. talks about, and ideas have consequences to larger. Yeah, extent. and Adam and Adam talked about that yeah. uh, before our show as well. Like, jump in any time here, Father. I like to talk, so um, and I know we're we're over the hour, so we can we can look for off roads anywhere. But I think these are the important conversations to have. We have, and you know, to tie it back to Great Lens, these th- this is the time to start to do that. This is a good time to do that to examine where you are how you got here and get humble uh there should be a humbling in this uh you know what what god did (laughs) was i think it's what has allowed him to to convert so many uh you know people from outside of the church is that idea especially from paganism is like no god ever before has ever come down as as a as a man and allowed himself to be sacrificed in that manner. Like, if you take nothing away, from, nothing else away from that, is that that you need to get humbled too. Uh, through not, it's not a humiliation. It's a purposeful, intentional. Bring yourself to a to a lower point. Ex- examine your pride. Right. Get get those right. things right. Well, what happened in 2020 with the lockdowns and stuff? had a similar effect on a lot of people maybe not always quite as dramatic as your case but i think canada was far more extreme than most places in the united states and like in texas for example we never had the full lockdown for more than like maybe a week or two and then after that they were already starting to relax it and and the governor declared that churches were not required to abide by it at all (laughs) and uh and now we have a constitutional amendment that we passed in Texas that says that no government entity on any level can shut down churches ever again. <laughs> uh, so, so it's good to live in a state like Texas. But, uh, but you know, when I, I went through a worldview shift when I discovered orthodoxy, it wasn't as dramatic. It took time. And uh, I would say that to some extent, it maybe took about two years to really work its way through. But when you're raised Protestant like I was, and then you come to a realization that 
Protestantism doesn't really make sense when you look at it in the light of history. And when you look at the, 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 the saints, the, for example, that knew the apostles like St. Ignatius of Antioch, it's very clear that they weren't Protestants. <laughs> and so you start unlearning what you learned as a Protestant, at least the things that were, that you can't carry with you. And, um, Look, but John was a Baptist. It's in the name. <laughs> yeah, know. well, you know, I was raised Nazarene, so we used to say John was a Baptist, but Jesus was a Nazarene. <laughs> 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 but, uh, uh, but you know, you, it, it, it gradually I began to, to, I reached the point where I was able to think more and more like an Orthodox Christian, but I just became aware that this process was going on. I'd read about worldview and worldview shifts prior to be, even being interested in orthodoxy. So I had some idea what the process was from an anthropological standpoint. Um, but, uh, but I went through it and the priest who baptized me and my wife, he, he told me very early on, he said, you know, it, it, it's going to take you some time to really think in an orthodox way. So just know that it's process. And, um, you know, it, 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 it there's, this, there's, I had a very strong sense of insecurity for a while because I was used to, as a Protestant associate pastor who knew the Bible pretty well as a Protestant, knew my theology as a Protestant pretty well, I could answer people's questions with a high degree of confidence that what I was telling them was accurate. But then when I started digging into orthodoxy, people would ask me questions and I would often have to second guess myself. Now, is this a Protestant answer that I'm giving this person or is this an orthodox answer? So sometimes I would say, well, I think the answer is this, but I'm not sure. I really need to do some more reading on the subject. So it, it was a humbling experience because you go from being the guy that everybody thinks knows something about the faith to the guy who's not that. One, one analogy that I use, I wrote a, I gave a speech uh, about uh, de develop acquiring an Orthodox mind, and you can read the text of it online. but. Uh, one analogy I use, I was into martial arts when I was in high school. So I was studying Northern Shaolin, Northern praying Mana style. And uh, so when I was studying that, that was the first style that I'd ever seriously studied. So I had no trouble learning the techniques. But I was in the class with people who had been black belts in Taekwondo or karate. And I always noticed that their stances seemed a little off and their techniques seemed a little off. And it was because they were so used to something that was similar but different. <laughs> It was hard for them to learn the style that we were actually there to learn because they knew something very close to it. And it's kind of like that when you're a Protestant and you start studying orthodoxy, you you there's you hear words and you think you know what they mean, <laughs> uh, but you don't necessarily know what they really mean from an orthodox perspective. And so it, you have to work harder to make that transition. And then years later, when I was in college, I you know, I, I decided to try to get back into shape and I was taking Taekwondo classes and I had the same thing in the reverse. You know, I, I had stances <laughs> that I'd learned from Kung Fu and now I was trying to do stuff the Taekwondo way and it wasn't easy to do because I was so used to doing it the other way. Uh, and so basically you might've been a black belt Protestant, but you have to be willing to become a white belt Orthodox Christian when you're making that transition. You have to be willing to say, okay, I'm starting off as a, as a novice. I have to learn these things, even though I came from some uh, group where I thought I knew stuff, but here I'm, I'm now here to learn uh, the Orthodox way. And I have to uh, take my time to do that. And I, didn't so much as try to teach a Sunday school class for children until I was had been Orthodox for about three years. I'm glad you brought up the insecurity. Um, well, certainly one of the things I went through was a feeling of unworthiness. Uh, and then I started to identify that as almost a weird form of pride, you know, that, you know, you, again, something that Father Turbo Quails said once that really hit me right there is that, um, that depression is a is a form of pride, you know. How all oh, things didn't work out for me, you know. I'm the I'm the the bad one. I you know I'm on you know even that unworthiness. I'm unworthy. It's like you can read throughout the saints and people who are in some ways far more unworthy than uh, than I was or I am, uh, if we want to go by that metric, um, and they can be uh, be saved or be, or be granted grace. So it's like. 
you know, check yourself a little bit. It's, right. it's you know, you're not, yes, you are as bad as you think you are, but you're not as bad, but you're not as bad as you, as you, as you seem to want to be like, it's, it's, uh, it's a strange, almost, um, prideful passion for, uh, for those, for those things. Um, yeah, I think maybe that's, it's a good place to, to, to stop there, father. We've, we've covered a lot. Um, what else do I have in my notes? Just, uh, Oh yeah, veganism. Um, the uh, of course with fasting, you know, my my wife constantly says, "Well, you're just vegan on Wednesdays and Fridays, or for the for, for great fast." Maybe we can touch on that a little bit uh, as a as a final note. Um, well, I've known people who eat essentially a vegan diet for health reasons. I'm not entirely sure that that's a great way to live an orthodox life. Just I I would personally think that it'd be good to maybe at least find something that's not Lenten that you partake of when it's not the fast. So that there's some distinction between the fast and not fasting. But if you are a vegan, one way to keep the fast is of course, just to eat less during the fast to cut your meals back and stuff like that. I mean, um, let's touch on that a little bit too, because I think that's what gets lost too. Everyone thinks uh, great Lent is about fasting, you know? Um, and that's what it's been, you know, fast a lot, pray a lot, go to church, you're good. But there's other elements to this, where I think people kind of either forget or, or it's not explained, um, giving alms, um, uh, uh, walk us through that. Um, well, think... giving alms and, and praying. I mean, the, what the saints say is that the two wings of prayer are fasting and alms giving. Hmm. And, um, so we, it, it, fasting just for its own sake is, is, not going to get you anywhere fasting is not an end it's a means to an end uh, and it, it helps you to pray uh, and uh, so if you're just approaching great lent and thinking hey i'm going to lose you know 20 pounds uh then you're not approaching fasting the way that it's really supposed to be i mean you might lose 20 pounds when you're fasting but uh but i the, think a lot of people put on weight because they just eat up they just you know, eat a lot of bread it's like it's bread well a lot of people though, do yeah. you know fortunately i'm married to a chinese woman who knows how to cook chinese food and you can get some healthy food that's lenten and uh right. i usually lose weight during the fast uh but uh and then put it back on when it's not <laughs> not the fast <laughs> but uh, uh but you know you you want to try to find a balance in in that and if you really have a health reason why you need to eat something that's pretty close to a vegan diet and some people have like a gluten allergy or something like that and so they they find that if they eat these certain kinds of foods they're healthier and it, it, their their life <laughs> is able to to function well if, if that's the case in some level that might be all you really need to do and, and another thing about fasting is is that you know, if you're sick, uh, a pregnant woman, you know, someone who's elderly, you're not really expected to fast. And the way I heard one Machka put it is, is that fasting is for the humbling of the flesh. But if your flesh is already humbled, you don't need to do anything extra uh, to humble it. So, you know, you do the best that you can. But certainly during a fasting period, if you're already keeping something that meets all the rules for fasting you would certainly want to be spending more time praying and probably eating a little less i remember last year i was hemming and hawing about what do i don't i i'm i'm, I'm observing i haven't been baptized so you know you get into those little debates in your head like how how much do i have to really do this you know um kind of thing and i remember last year i it was it, i think great Lent had just started and i was like eh, i don't know uh, and I ate a dodgy uh, chicken sandwich and was violently sick <laughs> for about four or five days. Wow! And I just like, and I was like, "All right, Lord, I get it. Okay, <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm observing Great Lent this year. Apparently, <laughs> like, I'm not yeah. doing that this year. I'm just, I'm, I'm just doing it straight out of the, straight out of the gate. Right. I've already started practicing, and it's like, you know, we're, we're just going to observe the fast and 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 be good with God. Right. One last note on that: alcohol. Because I know everyone, again, uh, I see a lot of people trying to be uh, very tribe about this uh, or, you know, finding finding loopholes, shall we say, uh, exceptions, being the exceptional one. Uh, when there's, you know, as you said, look, 
to talk to uh, I should have I should preface this of course is that I, I am talking to to a priest uh, but you should be talking to your priest uh, if you have any questions like your priest knows you best and, and knows your situation best don't please don't fill the comments with you know thirteen thousand questions that are pertaining to you I I'm, I'm not going to be able to give you your answer um, uh, so yes talk to your priest about your particular situation. However, if you're in that situation where, where you're kind of this person where you're like, well, you know, this book says after three and, you know, it's, it's, it's sun has gone down or sun has risen and it's, uh, it's a Sunday, it's, it's, it's a second Saturday and yada, yada, yada. And this book in the 14th century says I can do this or whatever. Right. Lay it out, brother. Like the general rule for things like alcohol, shellfish, which I always found interesting, um, being allowed or, or mollusks um let's yeah what, what's the what's the general consensus on alcohol during grand lead um and seafood in general well seafood really is lenten if it's uh shellfish and right. uh as long as it's not uh cooked in uh, butter or something like that now during a really strict fasting period like the first week of lent if you're having shellfish it it really shouldn't be like fried or something like that it really should be maybe steamed or part of a soup but if you think about someone who was a fisherman back in more ancient times if they weren't able to at least eat shellfish they would have had no way to feed their family from mm. the the main source of uh, <laughs> of their livelihood for half of the year basically um so shellfish are always okay and you can also eat earthworms and locusts and any kind of insect that you want to eat but uh dur during the fast but uh when it comes to alcohol you'll get different opinions on the subject what i would say is what what everybody would agree on is that if it's not a wine and oil day then obviously you're not supposed to be drinking wine mm -hmm. and uh and i think it's it's a bit of a stretch to say well but vodka or whiskey that's not wine so i can drink that well you know <laughs> that's uh you know a couple notches above wine in terms of indulgence and so probably that's not really keeping the spirit of the fast even if the tipicon doesn't specify vodka or wine I, i've heard the defense of like well beer's fine and i've used this by the way beer's fine because it's because it's made with wheat and that's like bread and bread and wheat right. that's, or potatoes that's okay. you know it's all lenten okay sure, of course yeah but uh <laughs> But beer is a little bit of a, you know, you'll get some different opinions on that from people. I've heard people say, oh, well, anyone who says that beer is okay is just really grasping at straws. But there is a wet tradition in the West that, that you know, it was declared to be Lenten. And if you read, um, like I, I read my kids the tales of King Arthur and the tales of Robin Hood, and you read them drinking beer all the time because at that time the only good water that you could drink would be beer because it been because of the process that was used to make it it made it uh, healthy whereas if you ju were just drinking water out of the stream you would probably get sick and die mm -hmm. um, so people drank beer as a normal uh, uh, beverage it was probably a little lower alcohol content than the the typical beer that you'd buy in the grocery store today but uh, okay. if you think of the Kvass, for example, that's a really low alcohol content. I think that, you know, there's no reason why you couldn't drink that during Lent. Uh, beer, some people would say no. Personally, I think if you had one beer at the end of the day, I wouldn't do it during the first week of Lent. Or at least I'd try not to do it. But outside of the first week of Lent and maybe Holy Week with the exception of Holy Thursday, which is a wine and oil day, yeah. and of course, Palm Sunday and Holy Saturday, uh, then... Uh, I would try to avoid it then too, but but if you're drinking a six pack of beer during Lent on a on a, on a single day, I'd say that's obviously not uh, keeping the spirit of the fast. So it's be a matter of, of, of and that balance. doesn't matter about your tolerance, folks. It's not about like, well, I can drink a twelve pack and be fine. It's like it's it's <laughs> drink two. Yeah, then. we're supposed to be the, the whole point of Lent is we're supposed to be denying ourselves, and uh, so. You know, if you're if you're overdoing it, like I said from the very beginning, you know, the father that said uh, anything that's of excess is from the demons. You know, the, mm -hmm. it, even if something is okay in moderation, that doesn't mean that it's okay when it's taken to excess. Yeah, not exactly. 
All right, Father. I think that brings us to the almost the hour and a half mark. Thank you so much again for doing this. Sorry, it was a it was a rocky start, folks, but we we ended well. I think we I feel like we ended strong. I woke up uh, fully, and uh, and uh, that's always a good sign, <laughs> Father. Uh, it, it, you know, people know where to find you. Yeah, I, I suppose if there's anything you want to end with, uh, we can end with that here. And then well, we'll, we'll you know, thank you for having me on. And that uh, was a good discussion. And uh, I would just remind everybody as we get into the to Lent that it seems a lot longer than it will actually be. <laughs> and so you have to hit the ground running. So anything you want to try to accomplish during Lent, you need to hit it during the first week or else you're going to be getting close to Pasca and thinking, man, I just let it go by and it didn't do it. So mm-hmm. try to try to get it going. Thank you again, Father. Um, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for watching, uh, liking, sharing, subscribing, all the things. We've been uh, seeing, again, still a fantastic growth of the channel. Uh, uh, that uh, that only happens because of uh, viewers like you. So I would just want to say again, uh, deeply appreciate it. Uh, and we will speak to you again soon. Father, if you just want to hang in for a second, I'll just do the outro. In a second, I need this. See, I should set these things up. I'm a professional podcaster. This is what I'm doing.